Chapter 2, Part 3 of Genji Monogatari. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Genji Monogatari by Murasaki Shikabu, translated by Suramatsu Kenchio. The long-continued rainy weather had now cleared up bright and fine, and the Prince Genji proceeded to the mansion of his father-in-law, where Lady Aoi, his bride, still resided with him. She was in her private suite of apartments, and he soon joined her there. She was dignified and stately, both in manners and demeanour, and everything about her bore traces of scrupulous neatness. Such may be one of those described by Sama no Kami, in whom we may place confidence, he thought, as he approached her. At the same time, her lofty queenliness caused him to feel a momentary embarrassment, which he at once tried to hide by chatting with the attendant maid. The air was close and heavy, and he was somewhat oppressed by it. His father-in-law happened to pass by the apartment, he stopped and uttered a few words from behind the curtain which overhung the door. "'In this hot weather,' said Genji in a low tone, "'what makes him come here?' and did not give the slightest encouragement to induce his father-in-law to enter the room. So he passed along. All present smiled significantly and twittered. "'How indiscreet!' exclaimed Genji, glancing at them reprovingly and throwing himself back on a kiyo sock in Bracket's arm-stool, where he remained calm and silent. It was by no means becoming behaviour on the part of the prince. The day was drawing to an end when it was announced that the mansion was closed in the certain celestial direction of the Nakagami, in bracket central god. His own mansion in Nijio, the one mentioned as being repaired in a previous chapter, was also in the same line of direction. "'Where shall I go, then?' said Genji, and without troubling himself any further, went off into a doze. All present expressed in different words their surprise at his unusual apathy. Thereupon someone reported that the residence of Kino Kami, who was in waiting on the prince on the banks of the middle river, the river Kiogok, had lately been irrigated by bringing the stream into its gardens, making them cool and refreshing. "'That's very good, especially on such a close evening,' exclaimed Genji, rousing himself. And he at once intimated to Kino Kami his desire of visiting his house, to which the latter answered simply, yes. He did not, however, really like the prince's visit, and was reluctantly telling his fellow attendants that, owing to a certain circumstance which had taken place at Io no Kami's residence, his wife, Kino Kami's stepmother, had taken up her abode with him that very evening, and that the rooms were all in confusion. Genji heard all this distinctly, but he would not change his mind, and said, That is all the better. I don't care to stay in a place where no fair statue dwells. It is slow work. Being thus pressed, no alternative remained for the Kino Kami and a messenger was dispatched to order the preparation of apartments for the prince. Not long after this messenger had gone, Genji started on his way to the house of Kino Kami, whose mild objections against this quick proceeding were not listened to. He left the mansion as quietly as possible, even without taking formal leave of its master, and his escort consisted of a few favourite attendants. The eastern front room in the dwelling quarters was wide open, and a temporary arrangement was made for the reception of the prince, who arrived there very quickly. The scene of the garden struck him before anything else. The surface of the lake sparkled with its glittering waters. The hedges surrounded it in rustic beauty, and luxuriant shrubs grew in pleasing order. Over all the fair scene the breeze of evening swept softly, Summer insects sang distinctly here and there, and the fireflies hovered about in mazy dances. The escort took up its quarters in a position which overlooked the stream of water which ran beneath the corridor, and here began to take cups of sake. The host hastened to order also some refreshment to be prepared for Genji. 
The latter was, meanwhile, gazing abstractedly about him, thinking such a place might belong to the class which Sami no Kami fairly placed in the middle category. He knew that the lady who was under the same roof was a young beauty of whom he had heard something before, and he was looking forward to a chance of seeing her. He then noticed the rustling of a silken dress escaping from a small boudoir to the right, and some youthful voices, not without charm, were also heard, mingled with occasional sounds of suppressed laughter. The casement of the boudoir had been, until a short time before open, but was pulled down by order of Kino Kami, who perhaps doubted the propriety of its being as it was, and now only allowed a struggling light to issue through the paper of the sliding screen. He proceeded to one side of his room that he might see what could be seen, but there was no chance. He still stood there that he might be able at least to catch some part of the conversation. It seems that this boudoir adjoined the general family room of the female inmates, and his ears were greeted by some faint talking. He inclined his head attentively, and heard them whispering probably about himself. "'Is it not a pity that the fate of so fine a prince should be already fixed?' said one voice. "'Yet he loses no opportunity of availing himself of the favours of fortune,' added another. These remarks may have been made with no serious intention, but as to Genji, he, even in hearing them, could not help thinking of a certain fair image of which he so fondly dreamt. At the same time, feeling a thrill on reflecting that, if this kind of secret were to be discovered and discussed in such a manner, what could be done? He then heard an observation in delicate allusion to his verse, which he had presented to the Princess Momozono, in brackets, Peach Gardens, with the flowers of Asagao, in brackets, Morning Glory or Convolvulus. What cautious beauties they are to talk in that way! But I wonder if their forms, when seen, will answer to the pictures of my fancy, thought Genji, as he retired to his original position, for he could hear nothing more interesting. Kinokami presently entered the room, brought in some fruits, trimmed the lamp, and the visitor and host now began to enjoy a pleasant leisure. "'What has become of the ladies? Without some of them, no society is cheerful,' observed Genji. "'Who can there be to meet such wishes?' said the Kinokami to himself, but took no notice of Genji's remark. There were several boys in the house who had followed Kinokami into the room. They were the sons and brothers of Kinokami. Among them there was one about twelve or thirteen who was nicer looking than the others. Genji, of course, did not know who they all were, and accordingly made inquiries. When he came to the last mentioned boy, Kinokami replied, He is the younger son of the late Lord Yemon. Now an orphan, and from his sister's connections, he is now staying here. He is shrewd and unlike ordinary boys. His desire is to take court service, but he has yet no patron. What a pity! Is then the sister you mention your stepmother? Yes, sir, it is so. What a good mother you have got! I once overheard the emperor, to whom I believe a private application had been some time made in her behalf, referring to her, said, What has become of her? Is she here now? said Genji, and lowering his voice, added, how changeable are the fortunes of the world. It is her present state, sir, but as you may perceive, it differs from her original expectation. Changeable indeed are the fortunes of this world, especially so the fortunes of women. Does he yot respect her? Perhaps he idolises her as his master. That is a question, perhaps, as a private master. I am the foremost to disapprove of this infatuation on his part. Are you? Nevertheless, he trusts her to such a one as you. He is a kind father. But where are they all? All in their private apartments. Genji by this time apparently desired to be alone, and Kino Kami now retired with the boys. All the escort were already slumbering comfortably, each on his own cool rush mat, under the pleasant persuasion of sake. 
Genji was now alone. He tried to doze, but could not. It was late in the evening, and all was still around. His sharpened senses made him aware that the room next but one to his own was occupied, which led him to imagine that the lady of whom he had been speaking might be there. He rose softly and once more proceeded to the other side of the room to listen to what he might overhear. He heard a tender voice, probably that of Kokimi, the boy spoken of before, who appeared to have just entered the room, saying, "'Are you here?' to which a female voice replied, "'Yes, dear, but has the visitor yet retired?' and the same voice added, "'Ah, so near and yet so far!' Yes, I should think so. He's so nice-looking, as they say. Were it daytime, I would see him too, said the lady in a drowsy voice. I shall go to bed too, but what a bad light, said the boy, and Genji conjectured that he had been trimming the lamp. The lady presently clapped her hands for a servant and said, Where is Chiuchio? I feel lonely. I wish to see her. "'Madam, she is in the bath now. She will be here soon,' replied the servant. "'Suppose I pay my visit to her too. What harm? No harm, perhaps,' said Genji to himself. He withdrew the fastening of the intervening door. On the other side there was none, and it opened. The entrance to the room where the lady was sitting was only screened by a curtain with a glimmering light inside.' By the reflection of this light he saw travelling trunks and bags all scattered about. Through these he groped his way and approached the curtain. He saw, leaning on a cushion, the small and pretty figure of a lady who did not seem to notice his approach, probably thinking it was Chiuchio, for whom she had sent. Genji felt nervous, but struggling against the feeling startled the lady by saying, Chiuchio was called for. I thought it might mean myself, and I come to offer you my devoted services. This was really an unexpected surprise, and the lady was at a loss. It is, of course, natural, he said. You should be astonished at my boldness, but pray excuse me. It is solely from my earnest desire to show at such an opportunity the great respect for you which I have felt for a long time. He was clever enough to know how to speak and what to say under all circumstances, and made the above speech in such an extremely humble and insinuating manner that the demon himself could not have taken offence, so she forbore to show any sudden resentment. She had, however, grave doubts as to the propriety of his conduct, and felt somewhat uncomfortable, saying shyly, "'Perhaps you have made a mistake.' No, certainly not, he replied. What mistake can I have made? On the other hand, I have no wish to offend you. The evening, however, is very irksome, and I should feel obliged if you would permit me to converse with you. Then, gently taking her hand, he pressed her to return with him to his lonely apartment. She was still young and weak, and did not know what was most proper to do under these circumstances, so half-yielding, half reluctantly was induced to be led there by him. At this junction Chiuchio, for whom she had sent previously, entered the room, upon which Genji exclaimed, Ha! Huh! Chiuchio stared with astonishment at him, whom she at once recognized as the prince, by the rich perfume which he carried about him. What does this mean? thought Chiuchio. She could still do nothing. Had he been an ordinary personage, she would have immediately seized him. Even in that case, however, there was enough room to doubt whether it would not have been better to avoid any violent steps, lest it might have given rise to a disagreeable family scandal. Hence Chiuchio was completely perplexed and mechanically followed them. Genji was too bold to fear bystanders, a common fault with high personages, and coolly closed the door upon her, saying, "'She will soon return to you.' The lady, being placed in such an awkward position, and not knowing what Chiuchio might imagine, became, as it were, bewildered. Genji was, however, as artful and insinuating as might be expected in consoling her, 
though we do not know where he had learnt his eloquence. This was really trying for her, and she said, Your condescension is beyond my merit. I cannot disregard it. It is, however, absolutely necessary to know who is who. But such ignorance, he a little abashed rejoined, as not to know who is who, is the very proof of my inexperience. Were I supposed to understand too well, I should indeed be sorry. You have very likely heard how little I mix in the world. This perhaps is the very reason why you distrust me. The excess of the blindness of my mind seems strange even to myself. He spoke thus insinuatingly. She, on her part, feared that if his fascinating address should assume a warmer tone, it would be still more trying for her, and more difficult to withstand. So she determined, however hard she might appear, not to give any encouragement to his feelings, and showed therefore a coolness of manner. To her meek character there was thus added a firm resolution, and it seemed like a young bamboo reed with its strength and tenderness combined, difficult to bend. Still she felt the struggle very keenly, and tears moistened her eyes. Genji could not help feeling touched. Not knowing exactly how to soothe her, he exclaimed, What makes you treat me so coolly? It is true we are not old acquaintances, but it does not follow that this should prevent us from becoming good friends. Please don't discompose yourself like one who does not know the world at all. It pierces my heart. This speech touched her, and her firmness began to waver. Were my position what it once was, said she, and I received such attention, I might, however unworthy, have been moved by your affection. But as my position in life is now changed, its unsatisfactory condition often makes me dream of a happiness I cannot hope to enjoy. Hereupon she remained silent for some moments, and looked as if she meant to say that she could no longer help thinking of the line, Don't tell anyone you've seen my home. But these few moments of silence agitated the pure waters of her virtuous mind, and the sudden recollection of her aged husband, whom she did not generally think much about, occurred tenderly to her memory. She shuddered at the idea of his seeing her in such a dilemma as this, even in a dream and without a word fled back to her apartment, and Genji was once more alone. Now the Chanticleer began to proclaim the coming day, and the attendants rose from their couches, some exclaiming, How soundly we have slept! Others, Let us get the carriage ready! Kino Kami also came out, saying, Why so early? No need of such hurry for the prince! Genji also arose, and putting on his naoshi, went out on a balcony on the southern side of the house, where he leaned upon the wooden balustrade and meditated as he looked around him. It appears that people were peeping out of the casement on the western side, probably being anxious to catch a glimpse of the prince, whose figure was indistinctly to be seen by them from the top of a short screen, standing within the trellis. Among these spectators there was one who perhaps might have felt a thrill run through her frame as she beheld him. It was the very moment when the sky was being tinted by the glowing streaks of morn, and the moon's pale light was still lingering in the far distance. The aspect of the passionless heavens becomes radiant or gloomy in response to the heart of him who looks upon it and to Genji's, whose thoughts were secretly occupied with the events of the evening, the scene could only have given rise to sorrowful emotions. Reflecting how he might on some future occasion convey a message to the lady, and looking back several times, he presently quitted the house and returned to the mansion of his father-in-law. During some days succeeding the above events, he was staying at the mansion with his bride, his thoughts, however, were now constantly turning to the lady on the bank of the middle river. He therefore summoned Kino Kami before him, and thus addressed him. 
"'Cannot you let me have the boy, the son of the late Chiunagon, whom I saw the other day? He is a nice lad, and I wish to have him near at hand. I will also introduce him to the emperor. I receive your commands. I will talk with his sister, and see if she consents to it,' replied Kino Kami with a bow. These last words, alluding to the object which occupied his thoughts, caused Genji to start. But he said with apparent calmness, has the lady presented you yet with a brother or sister? No, sir, not yet. She has been married now these two years. But it seems she is always thinking she is not settled in the way her parents desired, and is not quite contented with her position. What a pity! I heard, however, she was a very good lady. Is it so? Yes, I quite believe so, but hitherto we have lived separately and were not very cordial, which, as all the world knows, is usual in such a relationship. After the lapse of five or six days, the boy Kokimi was brought to him. He was not tall or handsome, but very intelligent, and in manners perfectly well-bred. Genji treated him with the greatest kindness, at which in his boyish mind he was highly delighted. Genji now asked him many questions about his sister, to which he gave such answers as he could, but often with shyness and diffidence. Hence Genji was unable to take him into his confidence, but by skilfully coaxing and pleasing him, he ventured to hand him a letter to be taken to his sister. The boy, though he possibly guessed at its meaning, did not trouble himself much, but, taking it, duly delivered it to his sister. She became confused and thoughtful as she took it, and, fearing what the boy might think, opened the letter and held it before her face as she read, in order to conceal the expression of her countenance. It was a long one, and among other things contained the following lines. I had a dream, a dream so sweet. Ah, would that I could dream again. Alas, no sleep these eyes will greet and so I strive to dream in vain. It was beautifully written, and as her eyes fell upon the passionate words, a mist gathered over them, and a momentary thought of her own life and position once more flashed over her mind, and without a word of comment to the boy she retired to rest. A few days afterwards Kokimi was again invited to join the prince, Thereupon he asked his sister to give him an answer to the prince's letter. "'Tell the prince,' she said, "'there is no one here who reads such letters.' "'But,' said the boy, "'he does not expect such an answer as this. "'How can I tell him so?' At first she half resolved to explain everything to Kokimi, and to make him thoroughly understand why she ought not to receive such letters. But the effort was too painful, so she simply said, it is all the better for you not to talk in that way. If you think it's so serious, why should you go to him at all? Yet how can I disobey his commands to go back? exclaimed the boy. And so he returned to Genji without any written answer to him. I was weary of waiting for you. Perhaps you too had forgotten me, said Genji when he saw the boy, who was, however, silent and blushed. "'And what answer have you brought me?' continued Genji. And then the boy replied in the exact words which his sister had used. "'What?' cried Genji, and continued. "'Perhaps you may not know, so I will tell you. "'I knew your sister before she knew Iyo, "'but she likes to treat me so because she thinks she's got a very good friend in Iyo. "'But do you be like a brother to me?' The days of Iyo will be probably fewer than mine. He now returned to the palace, taking Komini with him, and going to his dressing-room, attired him nicely in the court style. In a word, he treated him as a parent would do. By the boy's assistance, several more letters were conveyed to his sister. Her resolution, however, remained unshaken. If one's heart were once to deviate from the path, she reflected, the only end we could expect would be damage, reputation and misery for life. The good and the bad result from oneself. Thus thinking, she resolved to return no answer. She might indeed have admired the person of Genji, and probably did so, 
yet whenever such feelings came into her mind the next thought that suggested itself was what is the use of such idle admiration meanwhile genji was often thinking of paying a visit to the house where she was staying but he did not consider it becoming to do so without some reasonable pretext more especially as he would have been sorry and for her sake more than his own to draw a suspicion upon her it happened however after prolonged residence at the court that another occasion of closing the palace in the certain celestial line of direction arrived catching at this opportunity he left the palace and suddenly turning out of his road went straight to kinokami's residence with the excuse that he had just discovered the above fact on his way kinokami surprised at this unexpected visit had only to bow before him and acknowledge the honour of his presence the boy kokimi was already there before him having been secretly informed of his intention beforehand and he attended on him as usual in his apartment on his arrival the lady who had been told by her brother that the prince earnestly desired to see her knew well how dangerous it was to approach an inviting flower growing on the edge of a precipice she was not of course insensible to his coming in such a manner with an excuse for the sake of seeing her but she did not wish to increase her dreamlike inquietude by seeing him and again if he ventured to visit her apartment as he did before it might be a serious compromise for her for these reasons she retired while her brother was with genji to a private chamber of chiuchio her companion in the rear of the main building under the pretence that her own room was too near that of the prince besides she was indisposed and required tataki which she desired to have done in a retired part of the house genji sent his attendants very early to their own quarters and then through kokimi requested an interview with the lady kokimi at first was unable to find her till after searching everywhere he at last came to the apartment of chiuchio and with great earnestness endeavoured to persuade her to see genji in an anxious and half trembling voice while she replied in a tone slightly angry what makes you so busy why do you trouble yourself boys carrying such messages are highly blamable after thus daunting him she added more mildly tell the prince i am somewhat indisposed and also that some friends are with me and i cannot well leave them now and she again cautioned the boy not to be too officious and sent him away from her at once yet at the bottom of her heart different feelings might have been struggling from those which her words seemed to express and some such thought as these shaped themselves to her mind were i still a maiden in the home of my beloved parents and occasionally received his visits there how happy might i not be how trying to act as if no romantic sentiment belonged to my heart genji who was anxiously waiting to know how the boy would succeed in persuading his sister was soon told that all his efforts were in vain upon hearing this he remained for some moments silent and then relieved his feelings with a long-drawn sigh and hummed the hahaki gi distant tree spreads broom like o'er the silent waste approach how changed its shape we see in vain we try its shade to taste the lady was unable to sleep and her thoughts also took the following poetic shape too like the hahakiki tree lonely and humble i must dwell nor dare to give a thought to thee but only sigh a long farewell all the other inmates of the house were now in a sound slumber but sleep came not to genji's eyes he did indeed admire her immovable and chaste nature but this only drew his heart more towards her he was agitated at one moment he cried well then at another however still at last turning to the boy he passionately exclaimed lead me to her at once kokomi calmly replied it is impossible too many eyes are around us genji with a sigh then drew himself back on the cushion saying to kokimi 
You at least will be my friend and shall share my apartment. End of chapter 2, part 3